Hi, I'm Jared Potter, and we're talking about designing for Windows Phone 201. In this section, uh, we'll talk a little bit about me, which is uh, for the last three years, I've been working on Windows Phone. It's been my passion to be in the design studio, and I was design integration lead in the mobile studio for over three years. Currently, um, I'm the principal designer at 6 Half Studios. If you have any questions about these, you can always get a hold of me on Twitter at Jared T. Potter or LinkedIn at Jared T. Potter. Uh, today we're going to be talking about three different things. We're going to be talking about the system on Windows Phone, composition, and in this piece we'll be talking about uh, sort of page templates and how you'll create motion and integrate all that. Uh, and then last of, of all, we're going to be talking about the controls that you'll be able to use as a designer as well as the APIs that are made avail available for you on Windows Phone. So let's get started. The first thing we're going to talk about is the system. Now, uh, the first piece of the system is sort of the navigation model, but you wouldn't be able to talk about the navigation model if it wasn't for the hardware that the system was provided in. So we have a hardware spec, and obviously there's lots of different manufacturers and OEMs making really great phones like HTC and Nokia, but every single phone has some similar traits. One of the traits is that every single phone has a power and sleep button. Uh, you wouldn't be able to get to the UI at all without the power and sleep button. We have a volume up and down that controls obviously the volume, but also shows and hides a little bit of UI that allows you to skip forward and backwards through tracks. So that'll become necessary if you're working on an audio application where you're using background audio or anything like that. We have camera. We're going to talk more about that. You have lenses, controls, and some really fun, exciting functionality. We've got a back, start, and a search button at the bottom, and I'll talk about those in detail. Uh, so the very first thing is the start button. When a user presses the start button, this takes you to the iconic start screen that you see in Windows Phone with the live tiles, the action, and the icons that are all seen there displayed on the screen. Now one thing to note about this, the developer or designer has really no access to this. By default, when you press this button, it always will go back to the start screen and jump you out of whatever application either you've created or ever th whatever third-party application you're in at the time. The next hardware button to think about is the search button. The search button is always on the bottom right hand side and also this will always fire you basically into the Bing search. This is a global search across the whole system. You also have little control over this. You can use it uh, especially to jump out and look at search and go into a global search but not really a piece that you're going to customize or put some control on. The one that you have the most control over is the back button. The hardware back button is used to navigate back on pages and screens within applications or between applications. This is something that you actually do have control over in your history, although we really want you to use it in a consistent way across Windows Phone, similar to how we're using it in the, in the shipped applications that come with Windows Phone. Another thing to note about the hardware back button is that it does more than just let you go back from one application in the history stack to another or from one page to the other. It actually, on a press and hold, zooms out from the UI and allows you to jump and multitask back through the pages that you were working on. This is a really cool, quick piece of functionality. One of the ways that it works is if you were to tap on the last item, these would swap place, allowing you to flip between two applications if you were copying and pasting and doing other multitask. This is similar to how uh, dragging in from the left side of the screen on Windows 8 works for multitasking. So one of the things, I'm going to start off today talking a little bit about the navigation model and the history stack. And, and one of the things that I'd like to point out, the very first thing that I'd like to point out, remember back means back, not forward, not sideways, but back. On Windows Phone, we have a hub and spoke navigation model, meaning this is sort of the hub or the starting points, and then these are the spokes that go out from the beginning. If you hit the start button, you're always going to end up going back to that start screen, that home screen. Likewise, as you drill out into the applications, if you hit the back button, you'll continuously go backwards up towards that start screen. If there's nothing left in the history stack, you will end up back at the start screen. So let's do the, and a quick example of that. Here, this has been the same since the first version of Windows Phone, where you would start on an old start screen. You'd click and go into something like the People Hub. After that, you'd click and maybe go in to see your what's new, or actually in this case, you're in a panorama, so you would just pan over to the right-hand side and see what's new. And you might click on a social feed. When you see that social feed, if you hit the back button, you would go back, of course, to the panorama that you're from. But one of the things that I'd like to point out is that moving sideways left and right in both a pivot or a panorama, just interacting on the same page, doesn't add or remove anything from the history stack. So if I was to hit back again, 
it would actually remove all that history. That's all been the same since Windows Phone 7. It's been consistent and it's never changed. Uh, another thing, another way to look at this is we, if we were to start out at the People Hub, click on a contextual menu, which is a press and hold, and I'll get into that later, talking a little bit about contextual menus and other systems. And I was to do something like pin that item to the start screen. It would kick me out to the old start screen, once again, the same since the beginning. And then if I were to click on that person's contact card, it would go directly into the contact card. The only difference with this, and if I pivot over, of course, in their history and look at that, is that when I start to go backwards, back up this history stack, you'll go back to history, back to the profile, back to start screen. But remember, this step that I did was a press and hold. It was just a contextual menu. So I would actually skip that and go right back to the People Hub. So by default, one of the things that you need to remember is that you can do some manipulation of the back stack. As a developer or a programmer, anything that might be something like a shopping cart or a, a modal window or something that pops up that gives you options, you might want to remove, right? It gave you the option to pin that to the start screen or edit it or delete it. After you've done that and you hit back, you don't really want to go back and say, hey, do you want to edit this again? Most likely you do not and you've already completed that function. Uh, so something like this, this is a great example. You're going into a shop cart or a wish list. You do some billing. You put in your credit card, you pay for that, and then you're finished. If you hit the back button, you don't want to have to pay for all that stuff again. You'll just jump right back into the shopping experience. So that's kind of how we want you to use and manipulate the back stack. Uh, here's another example of that with search results. Jumping from the front and the back, but more, most likely in most of these scenarios, we just want you to continuously use the system that was created for you. Uh, there are a couple of uh, places and UIs that you would absolutely want to remove, which are like transient UIs, uh, loading screens that come in that have nice animations. Maybe you built those out as their own page or their own item. Uh, maybe it actually has a pop-up that comes up at the very beginning that allows you to log in. You wouldn't want to, if you hit the back button, be asked to log in again. Once you've logged in, you're logged in for good, unless, of course, you log out. So here's a couple of navigation how-tos when you're using the Windows Phone system. Trust the hardware start and back. Don't try to program around it. Obviously, with the start button, we don't let you do much with it. But with the back button, we do allow you to remove things from the history stack, add things to the history stack. But really, use the system the way it was meant to be uh, used. The second thing I'd like to say is be really predictable. Uh, we are predictable, and we work very hard across the whole OS to be very predictable in the way that you interact with Windows Phone, um, especially with Windows Phone 8. But uh, we don't want you to come in and introduce new navigation models. Um, one of the things that you will notice, you'll notice on Windows Phone, the back button will never delete text in a text box. And we want that to be consistent across, even though you could wire that up. Uh, avoid traps, loops, and phantom pages. We never want you to get in, into a place where you're actually moving in a circle or you get stuck in a navigation model and then you have to hit the home screen to back out. This is also really important because our uh, apps are very tightly integrated. You can jump out to the People Hub and grab a contact, come back into an app. You can pick people out, you can pick music. Like for example, from messaging, you're allowed to add music and it jumps you out to another app and then back in. Well, the last thing we want you to do is accidentally get stuck. If you stick with our navigation model and these simple how-tos, you'll never get stuck. You'll simply be able to go forward and back and navigate the system the way it was meant to be navigated. Uh, the next thing that I'm going to talk about after navigation is the shell. And the shell is made up of a lot of different things. These are all things that are provided to you to make your application take it to the next level. One of the very first things that we'll be talking about is live tiles. Live tiles are beautiful. They're in your face. These are amazing little gems that bubble up information to your application directly to your user. So Windows Phone, since the beginning, has had one form or another of live tiles. In Windows Phone 8, we've actually taken that to the next level, which is a really exciting piece. And since the beginning of Windows Phone, users, as well as sort of the design reviewers, have been very excited about the introduction of live tiles. So let's get started. Live tiles. The user can resize these tiles now between small, medium, or wide at any time. Uh, on Windows Phone 7 and Windows Phone 7.5, you were able to do uh, medium and large now. And a lot of them, you really couldn't make the decision between the two. Uh, now you actually have the choice of doing small, medium, or large. And usually the user, you can provide to the user the option to flip between all three of those sizes. Uh, 
You should provide a user the way to turn the tile notifications off and on at any time within your app. We don't want to force the user to be staring at the live tile updating constantly. It's an option. We want them to be able to use it if that's what they want. Uh, then also, another thing that we've added to Windows Phone 8 is three different tile templates. We've got Flip, Iconic, and Cycle. I'll explain those all to you, and you, I'm sure you guys will use them for, to make your app great. So, first, let's talk a little bit about the tile sizes. Uh, here is small, medium, and large tile size. This is the iconographic tile size. Um, and the way that you're going to want to decide to use these different tile sizes is basically based on whether or not you have the content for these tile sizes. If you don't have a lot of content for a large tile size, don't force the user into using a large tile size. Um, if you don't have the content for a medium as well, uh, use only a small or a medium tile if your app won't use tile notifications to send updates to the user. It's a good rule to live by. Uh, the next thing I'd like to say is the different types of tiles that you can use other than the size. These are the animations that are on the tiles. These are the type of content that you can put in. Um, these are things that are basically plug and play that you can utilize super fast. Uh, first, there's flip. So live tile flip. The flip template provides two surfaces in medium and wide sizes to give users a lot of info. So basically, you have one side of the tile. You can put some text and some content. Uh, and a title, and then that tile will flip over, and on the other side, you'll be revealed with an image or whatever you want the content to be on the back side of the tile. Uh, this is really cool to have two different things. A good use would be a weather app that displays the current temperature on the front and the, and the five day forecast on the back, or a bus tracking app that shows stop and arrival times on the front and a map of the current bus location on the back. Uh, a couple of the bad uses of this would be a train app that displays a logo on the front and then the stops on the back. So you're having to wait when you're looking at the front to get data while you're looking at their branding and then you, once it flips to the back you actually get the time and data. That's the bad use. Instead, you want these both to be kind of the same information but in a different context, right? This is the last update or last thing that was sent in. Here's a little text about it. Just more of the same data. The next is Iconic. The Iconic template displays an image in the center of the tile and is designed to reflect the Windows Phone design principles. So uh, in the small tile and the medium tile, you basically get the icon. In the large template, you're going to get it down in the bottom right-hand corner. This is a really simple, beautiful, and very uh, Windows uh, design language way of presenting your data. A couple of good uses for this is for messaging, voicemail, news readers, general communication apps, anything that sort of has a counter or something that you need to go and see that you've missed items and that you should visit that application. Social networking apps that can taste, convey status, timeline updates, and waiting for notifications, um, maybe even some status previews on the big tile, right? Bad use, updates that rely on images. Um, to convey meaning, photo feeds, or anything that uh, would be basically non-iconographic, right? That's what, this one's all focused on icons. The next thing is cycle. Um, and the cycle template cycles through individual images, basically from a gallery that you've created, and it's one through nine on the tile. So if you have multiple images and you want to kind of feed through them in a beautiful visual way, we've canned that for you. We've made it super available. You don't have to do a lot of work, and they even control the animations that go in between them. It's a beautiful and simple way to make your application feel like a native application that was part of Windows Phone 8's ecosystem from the get-go. Uh, so here's a couple of tiles how-to. How Pick the right template from Flip, Iconic, and Style. Use the, use the uh, how-tos that I mentioned before to kind of choose these, but really think about what fits, fits your application best. Uh, number two, use fresh, frequently updated content that makes customers feel that your app is active when it's not running. If you just have a, a, a converting app, um, uh, a utility converter, any of these kind of applications, you may not need a live tile. Um, you may not have to force your application into a live tile. Really think about when it's required and when it's going to be interesting uh, for the user. Personalized or tailored updates that use what you know about your customer. So this is a really cool one. Because you have a phone, this is their most personal object. They keep it in their pocket. They take it every single place they go. Um, and if you have the data about this person, you know where they're at and all kinds of different things, give them personalized and tailored content to that user. Don't just make it generic content that's being blasted out. The last thing that you want your live tile to be is spam. 
Uh, lastly, content relevant to the customer's current context. Uh, this is very much like the last point, but it's basically like they, you know their location, you know what they're doing, if they're shopping or not. Um, please give them information that's relevant to that context. The next thing that I'm going to talk a little bit about is the page structure of the shell. Uh, so we've got, if you look at a Windows phone, uh, something that may be very familiar to you or very new and exciting to you. Up at the top we have something called the status bar. This is where you can get information about connectivity and all kinds of different things. We have sort of the application space and you as a third party application developer will get to use this. This is sort of your canvas to go to town with. We have an application menu bar um, and an application bar when it's collapsed. This will be your options and menus that you can stuff all your different uh, functionality into for your application. So let's get started. We'll talk first about the system tray. The system tray sits up at the very top of your UI. Uh, it provides you with all the information a user could need to know about their battery, connectivity, Bluetooth, and running services. As a matter of fact, running left to right across the top, you have signal strength, data connection, call forwarding, roaming, wireless networking, signal strength, Bluetooth status, ringer mode, input status, battery power level, and system clock. Now in the last segment, we talked a little bit about the design principles behind Windows Phone. It was all about the content, not the Chrome. It was all about just showing content that's relevant to you and hiding everything else. Uh, the system tray does exactly that. By default, the system tray will be hidden up across the top. Uh, as a third party developer, you can uh, actually show and hide this completely in your application. You could have it appear on screen or you could get rid of it for a full screen application. Uh, by default, the second step that you can do is if anything is important or needs to be bubbled up to you right away, like if the phone battery is dying or if it's plugging in and powering up, or if you're connecting to a new Wi-Fi, one of the individual icons that is the important icon will appear at that time. So here's mine charging. Uh, if you tap anywhere along that top pixels, uh, double tap or tap directly on the, t the time, uh, it'll expand out the system tray and you'll get to see all those options. A couple of the other states of it are text displaying what the status of that current application that you're on is, um, as well as you can modify these properties. Obviously show and hide that I mentioned earlier, the background color that you see us doing in Office, um, the opacity of that overlay, the progress bar. I will get more to progress bars in a little bit later, but the progress bar, this is one spot where you can say globally whether you're loading data down, whether you know when it will be done loading, or whether it's just indeterminate progress, as well as some text. And this could be, say, loading. This could say recent documents are up to date and let the user know that you're completely synced. It's a fantastic global way to show kind of your overall status. So here's a couple of system tray how-tos. Try to show it if at all possible. It's really easy in your application to love your design and make a design that's not really suited for the Windows Phone. It's just a great mobile app. But if you can, turn it on at the top. Make your design around it so that it fits nicely in. You never want an application that's getting used all the time and a user can't even see the time. Uh, the time, the clock, the battery life. One of the great uses of this on Windows Phone is the browser. Uh, by default, it's gone, it's disappeared, and you get a full screen browsing experience. As soon as you tap and expand uh, the address bar at the bottom, you get the data, the time, the alarm clock, everything drops down from the top. So you have a way without leaving the browser to always check the time. Uh, use it for progress or to show status. Uh, you can build this into your own applications. You can write this code. You can have a developer write this code for you, but we've done it for you. All you need to do is fire off the system tray and allow it to open and expand itself and push a little text up to the top. All right, next. Lost my spot there. Sneak peek. Uh, you will be talking about the app bar. So the app bar is basically the menu system in Windows Phone 8. It's been there since the beginning, since we first started in Windows Phone 7, but it's docked at the bottom and it's always at the bottom. Um, actually, unless you go into portrait or landscape mode, in which case it'll go on the left or the right hand side of the screen. There's a couple different steps, uh, states. There is the minimized app bar icon, and this is specifically to be used in panoramas. I'll get um, more into that and you can use it in other scenarios but it was originally designed to be in panorama controls. Uh, there is the default state which is a collapsed version of this and then of course there's the expanded state. By default you get four icon slots to put uh, menu items in. These are little uh, graphical icons 
and they have a single piece of text. This text is very short though. Uh, it doesn't allow you a lot of space, so pre please try to use the shortest words possible. You know, you'll notice on Windows Phone we hardly ever go over seven characters when it comes to this. It's words like new, select, sync, search, and don't ever use two words in that. It's just supposed to be very simple. If you have longer text or something that can't be described with an icon, push it down to the menu items underneath. By a pressing on the dot 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 or a flick gesture up, it'll expand up the application bar and it will show you a scrolling list of the uh, menu items underneath. These can be uh, additional items that couldn't have shown off uh, in the top level icons. So application bar icons. Application bar, bar icons should be, as you design these, should be very clear, understandable, and leverage real-world metaphors that are familiar to users. In the last segment, we talked about navigation graphics and infographics. This is where we got the inspiration for these. And the best icons have very simple geometric uh, shapes and limit the amount of fine detail. So it's something that should really because you can't really localize these in an easy way, the way you can localize text string to a different language or do globalization, um, try to use an icon that people across the world are going to understand, even if the text has been translated. So here's a couple of app bar uh, how-tos. Use icon buttons for the primary most used actions in any application. If there's something that's getting used day to day and they're hitting it really quick, the, the app bar that rests at the bottom of the screen is the closest to their finger and thumb and is the fastest way for them to act on those items. The application uh, bar is perfect for this. Um, don't use four icons just to use them. Uh, it's very fun and cool little control at the bottom, but sometimes just because there's those four slots in there, you can use one, two, or three icons just as easily. And in a lot of times, less is more in this space. Uh, if you only have searching on a list, a very simple search icon it being the only thing in the app bar is fine. It works great. Um, and then use the user-defined system theme colors unless there's a compelling reason to override this. Later in this section, I'm going to talk about theming, how you can theme your entire application and how Windows Phone supports light, dark themes as well as accent colors. If you use the defaults, everything will work perfectly. The text will be legible. As soon as you start to tweak that, your use cases and the things that you're going to need to test uh, are going to go more and more and up and up. Uh, so by default, use the user theme defined theme colors, uh, the system defined theme colors if you can, um, but if you have a highly customized app, just put in the time to test it against light themes and dark themes. We'll get more to that in a second. Here's something else uh, that is great for the system. It's called Toasts, and it basically pops up at the top of the screen right here. You'll notice right next to the system tray, and a toast displays at the top of the screen to notify the user of an event such as news or a weather alert. An incoming text message also fires this up. Here's the anatomy of a toast. It basically has an app list icon. Every toast is correlated with an application. When an incoming text message comes in, it will have the text SMS icon. Uh, then there's text one, which is basically a bold text, and then the text to follow, which is content text. A text waits around for around 10 seconds, and one of the things that you can do to dismiss this text and just get rid of it is a swipe of your finger uh, to the right-hand side, and it will throw it off the screen. Here's a couple of quick little hints about working on them. Uh, to, to, toast links, they basically truncate and run right off the right hand side. side. You don't wrap the text in them, um, and this is a controversial decision, but very easy to read and legible as long as you limit it, your content inside it. With the title, approximately 40 characters can be displayed. Content only, then approximately about 47 characters can be displayed because you don't have that bold text on the left hand side. If a toast is split evenly between title and the content, then approximately 41 characters can be displayed. We've measured this out in the design studio. Keep your toast simple if at all possible. This is the kind of thing that's going to be bubbling up when someone's sitting in a meeting, driving in the car. We don't want them to be distracted at all. It's something that you should be able to glance and go. Any text that does not fit in the toast will be truncated on the right-hand side. Next, we're going to talk a little bit about if you need to throw up a bigger notification or a different alarm or reminder that's uh, larger than a toast notification, these don't need to be app specific. Whereas a toast, as soon as it pops up, you could click on it and it will 
open directly the app that it came from. Uh, this is basically anything that you can utilize in your application. It's a dialog that pops up over the screen. There's two different ways to get rid of it, actually three. One would be to click anywhere off the outside of it. A back button press would also remove it, as well as if you just hit, if they give you any sort of dismiss dialog or buttons or UI on the thing, clicking that would also dismiss uh, the alarms or reminders. These things are great for if you have any sort of OK or cancel verification in your UI that you need to use. Uh, but de by default, uh, text content is the best for them. Now lock screen. We've always had a lock screen on our phone, uh, but on Windows Phone 8, it is getting more beautiful, more customizable, and better for the app ecosystem. You can customize your lock screen to show upcoming appointments, new calls, text, updates from apps, and more, plus a pretty new picture as often as you like. Um, in the very center section of this, I'll break down the anatomy of a lock screen. You basically have the time and date. Over here, you have a detail or status, a big status, and then down here you have quick statuses, which are icons along the bottom. In the background, you have a background picture, and of course you have the system tray at the top that shows on the start screen and all the different apps. Um, but a user can now uh, customize this area and this right in here, detailed status, to define whether it's um, being used by different applications or they can choose which five applications it uses. Uh, the lock screen background, applications can now push out their own images into the lock screen background. This is something that we've exposed to third party applications and designers. So here's the default. Um, you basically, if you have this lock screen background, uh, you're going to need kind of to put your content in this area. Don't put text content in any underneath this text or it might be confusing. All of these graphics are overlaid with a slight layer of black with opacity on it. Uh, so that even if it's white, you'll be able to see this white text sitting on top of it. However, text over text is not legible. It gets very confusing to the user. So try to keep your areas. If you're using the WVGA resolution of 480 by 800, keep it to about 288 pixels by 288 pixels. If you're going all the way up to the HD 720p resolution, keep it about 432 uh, by 432. But mostly think top left-hand corner of the display area. So a couple of lock screen how-tos. Um, keep the logo and text small on the screen so it doesn't compete with the date, time, or notifications. Um, if you're including a logo, consider making it slightly transparent. Uh, this, is, this way it'll kind of sit nicely behind the overlay. If you choose to include text, it should relate directly to your image so that it's not confusing or competing with the text from all the other apps that are bub bubbling up content at that point in time. Uh, the visual focus of the lock screen image should be the image, not the logo or the text. So those five icons down at the bottom, the user decides. You really can't control whether or not they, which application they're going to bubble up to it. Also, the big status right directly above that, the user decides as well. If your application is defining the background, please keep these rules in mind and don't try to fight or compete with other apps in the ecosystem. It can make for a really messy thing and it will be the quickest way that they'll decide to turn off your application. Next, the context menu. We've already talked, talked about the application menu. The app bar down at the bottom is basically menu items for this entire screen. But what, how do you get to menu options on an individual list item or some single smaller piece of UI that's nested in that page? The way that we do that is with the context menu. Context menus are opened by a press and hold on any menu item. Uh, allow up to five menu items on a single UI element. So if you have email, you could do delete, mark as unread, move, set flagged. Um, and you can dismiss these guys similar to the app bar or similar to a notification by just clicking anywhere else or hitting the hardware back button. And that will get rid of it. Keyboards. Keyboards are also a system level thing. You'll think about these a little bit, but uh, by default in the shell, we've created some beautiful keyboards, award-winning keyboards for you to use. Windows Phone supports basically around eight different layout types for English. You can switch between textual layout types. You can switch between, um, oh sorry, numeric, textual, and then of course ones that would be specific for sending, putting an email address with an at and .com symbol in them. Um, you basically just need to set what the in input scope is on the different text box fields. In this way, you won't, all of these uh, different keyboards you can navigate to from the basic keyboard, meaning if you just got an alpha, 
numeric one, you could flip over to numeric numbers or special characters. However, if you give them the one that's tailored to them in that specific scenario in that application, you're going to be that much better and your app's going to feel that much more native and thought through. Screen orientations. Uh, like most smartphones today, you can rotate a Windows phone and get different layouts. Uh, so by default, we have the portrait, and then we actually have two types of landscape. We have landscape to the right, and we have landscape to the left. By default, portrait is sort of the default layout of panoramas and um, pivots and other sort of pages will work really well with landscape left and right. When you go landscape right, one of the things you'll notice, the app bar moves over to the left to be closer to your thumb over here on your left hand side and the system trays on the right. If you go landscape left, the uh, app bar will be on the right hand side and the system trays on the left. One of the things that you should think about and notice when you're designing an application, if you're designing a page that has uh, a system tray or an app bar at the top and bottom, when you go into landscape mode, that, that screen will be skinnier than if you did not have a system tray and a no, uh, um, system tray and an app bar, sorry, uh, at the top and the bottom. So the resolution or the width will change on your application. Screen orientations. Uh, so this is when it flips. It's basically right around 60 degrees left, 60 degrees right. It'll flip up into portrait. Um, landscape left and landscape right. This is also the way that you'll see it. Um, there's no programmatic way to switch orientations on the phone. You basically just need to let the phone tell you when this is going to happen. Uh, you can also lock in a page that says, I'm not going to listen to orientations. I'm going to be default landscape left, default landscape right, or um, a, a portrait page. But other than that, you cannot fire off these events and pretend that the phone has done these things. Uh, so here's a couple of orientation how-tos. Avoid creating text input heavy landscape experiences. Text is really hard to read for a user if it's long in between wrapping. And when you go into portrait on a phone, you definitely have a longer view. And so when you're designing that application, make sure that you limit the length of that text when it wraps when you're in portrait mode. Another thing that I pointed out earlier, there's no programmatic way to switch orientations. And remember, um, system tray hidden uh, will affect the landscape width of your UI. So showing or hiding both the system tray or the app bar will affect that width when you're in landscape. <clears throat> so that sort of wraps up our talk about all the shell different controls. The next thing I'm going to talk about is system level and kind of these uh, system level touches and gestures that you can use on the phone. These are pretty standard uh, across a lot of different products and everything at Microsoft, but uh, we're going to be talking a lot about specifics and implementation practices. First off, namely touch targets. Your app should present users with a touch target of ample size, big enough for your finger to hit. Users should get feedback that their taps have operated controls um, and have allowed them to make progress in your app. To these ends, Windows Phone has certain requirements about using touch. So when you're thinking about doing touch, um, there's a couple things that you need to take into account. You need to take into account the shape, the location that it's on screen, the frequency of that use, uh, the visual design, kind of the padding um, and the way that it looks, kind of the opacity of it all, and then sort of your error consequences. If you miss that, are you accidentally going to hit another button that deletes it? Or if you miss that, are you going to just going to get to try again? If there's a lot of items slammed close together that all have functionality built into them, like a stack of buttons, you really want to think about the size of your hit targets. So first, let's start with a couple of rules. The minimum size of a hit target. You can't measure this in pixels, right? Because there's different size phones. We've got big phones, large phones, small phones. And then now, with Windows Phone 8, we actually have different resolutions. So the way that we measure these is actually in millimeters. The default smallest size that we want any hit target to be is nine millimeters across. This is already baked into our default controls. You don't have to program this, but like our our whole system is customizable, so are hit targets on buttons. You could come in there and f uh, mess around with this and potentially make your app a little bit difficult to use. On our system, we have a couple of hit targets that are seven millimeters high. You're allowed to do this, we do this, but one of the rules that we try to get you to stand by, if it's a seven millimeter high hit target, make sure that it's a long and skinny hit target so that they can miss to the left and right. We find that this uh, improves usability 
And so uh, nine millimeters would be the default square, but if you're using a seven millimeter high one, please make it a rectangle. Uh, another thing uh, for negative hit targets is that your hit targets don't actually have to be the size of the visual object on screen. Uh, in Windows Phone, we use negative hit targets or negative hit margins. You may have heard these called. Um, in most cases, make the visual size equal to the touch target size, uh, but using spacing makes controls look easier to hit. So take into account sort of the visual spacing, the visual asset, the touch target, and the dead space when you're doing this. If you have a lot of space, make your hit target a little bit bigger. You never want it to be so big that someone tries to tap over here and accidentally hits your button, but you do want to make it big enough that if somebody is holding their phone and walking down the street and they tap and barely miss in those two or three millimeters on the left or right hand side, that they actually hit the button. And this way, we've improved the usability a lot on Windows Phone, and it feels like they're always hitting the button when sometimes they actually miss. So, small targets how-to. Make the target size bigger than the visual asset. Introduce space between uh, adjacent visual assets. Um, and we're all about white space on Windows Phone anyway, so if you're designing a, a Windows design language style phone, it shouldn't be a problem for you. Um, and then create a visual padding around the asset. So here's an example of this, the negative hit targets. Here's edit up in the top of a dialog. And then here's in a list. We've got a little padding and spacing in between, so you're not just bumping those icons right up next to each other. Next, we're going to talk a little bit about gestures. Input gestures are vital to Windows Phone because we're basically um, a touchscreen device. We have some hardware keyboards, but this is mostly the way that we interact with the device. This is pretty standard. It's a tap. A tap is just a single brief touch on the screen within a bounding area and back up again. It's not a tap if the finger comes down and moves slightly. That goes into a different gesture, but one of the most interesting things about tap gestures is that they actually have to come down and then come back up. As soon as you do anything else, it's engaged a totally different gesture. So it's basically the time down and the time up. So you'll notice that taps never engage really until that release. Um, so a finger down provides touch indication. Finger, finger up executes the command. A double tap. Double taps are not used very regularly on Windows Phone. One of the ways that they're used is in images to zoom in and out or on browsers to zoom in and out. In the image controls, we use them. And then also in the web browser control that you're provided with to design your own applications, you have use of this. So you can double tap. You also have this control to use in your own way, right? This gesture is something that we've programmed in. So you could write your own functionality around it. We just ask that you kind of use it in lines with the way that we're always already using it. Next, a pan. I mentioned this earlier. A pan is a single finger down, and if your finger doesn't come right back up and do a, a tap right then, then you are in the panning gesture. Um, and, or actually, if it moves, if it begins to move across the screen. So a, a pan is a single finger placed down and moved across the screen in any direction. The pan gesture ends when the finger is lifted, and usually this does not make the UI glide after it. What usually makes the UI glide is a flick. This is a much faster gesture that moves quickly across the screen and then lifts up. A flick is a single finger down moved rapidly in any direction and ends with the finger up. The math between a pan and a flick is pretty complicated, so I'm not going to explain it to you because I don't quite get it. Um, but basically, you can use these two interactions for two totally different things. It's very common for us to resort things with a pan, like a list, but when you're flicking it, it just moves you rapidly through that list. Um, flicks are very common for moving the entire UI and a whole canvas. Pinch and stretch. Pinch and stretch is two fingers down within separate bounding areas, followed by the fingers either moving in or out. Um, and so one of the regular things is when you do a stretch, it will blow up the content. When you do a pinch, it'll zoom back down the content. A touch and hold. Touch and hold is a single finger down, like a tap that just stays there. Um, this is commonly used and definitely used on our start screen to begin editing things. So in any sort of uh, context menu scenarios, a press and hold like this will bring up a menu and give you additional options. On the start screen, a press and hold like this will actually throw everything into edit mode and allow you to resort the live tiles on start screen. So here's a couple of gesture how-tos. 
you have up to four touch points and maybe more depending on the hardware for Windows Phone. You can create your own, but we don't make it super easy for you. It's very easy for you to use the can gestures that are already implemented in the system. Um, and then the last couple of things, performance tune-up applications that support more than two simultaneous touch endpoints to ensure application performance doesn't suffer. Whenever you're tracking multiple things across the UI, um, this applies to animations and everything, you're really going to need to start thinking about performance because you're only using a phone. It's not like desktop hardware. Uh, this run uh, summarizes up and ends up, <laughs> finishes up the talk about Windows Phone 8 system. Next, we'll be talking about composition controls and APIs. See you then. Thank mm -hmm. you.